Hey everybody, Ryan here with Plague Size Studios. Welcome to what should be the new channel record holder for the most ridiculous and longest video I've ever created. This will be Kemper versus Line 6 versus Fractal Audio Systems versus real tube amplifiers and analog or digital pedals. Plague Scythe Studios style. It's gonna be the biggest shootout I've ever done, hopefully the largest one I ever will do because I already have over two hours worth of raw recordings that I somehow have to distill down to be digestible in one video because uh, splitting up videos is just not an option on YouTube anymore with the way the algorithm works. So I wanna to attempt to make this as efficient as possible, which sounds laughable given the length, but this is gonna be a dense video. There's gonna be a lot of things that I'm trying to cram into here, but not at the expense of the quality of the information and hopefully the quality of the shootout, the test plan, if you will. As such, I'm gonna be glossing over a lot of details that I would have already covered in the individual videos on all of these products. So if you want to know more about things like the differences in IO, or exactly how you make a preset or a profile or what have you, I would encourage you to check out the individual videos of the product that you're most interested in or products, um, though that's another three to four hours worth of content if you watch all of that. So uh, I guess buckle up and you know choose your favorite beverage and, and snack because this is gonna be a feature length film. Before I get rolling on the technical information and probably what will end up being a long list of caveats for this video, I think it's best that I kind of go over how this video is going to be structured. That way, if you want to see a particular section only and go to that demonstration, that shootout, you can do that, save yourself some time. Or if you are just interested in my analysis for some reason and don't want to listen to any audio, you can do that as well. Kind of a weird choice, but hey, it's it's all up to you. That's what this video is all about. Uh, first off, we'll go through all of the gear choices here. Again, kind of going to highlight some of the specifics, why I chose each one, the things that make this particular shootout interesting versus some of the other ones that I've seen of this kind of gear. The second chapter is more of a functional prologue to the shootouts that will follow it as we lay the foundation for the tones that you're gonna hear going forward. We'll actually be listening to real mic cabinets versus the impulse responses that were shot of that setup to kind of show you how those things compare and some of the variables we have to isolate when we're talking about real amps versus amp modelers and how you would use them in the real world. The third section is where we start getting into tube amps versus the virtual tube amp models or profiles on all of the gear you hear. Section four concerns amplifier models whose real life tube and steel counterparts I don't have access to. And that's a big reason a lot of us, including myself, recommend devices like this because you don't have to own 10 different types of plexis. You don't have to own a diesel VH4 to get those sounds. You can get them here. So while the previous section will lay some decent framework for how these compare to their real life counterparts, section four will be kind of a vertical slice of how a lot of people are going to be comparing these things because you're not going to have the real amplifier next to it to judge whether this 5150 model sounds right or whether this boosted JCM 800 sounds right. Sometimes you do, and of course that's kind of half the point of this video, but this will also be kind of a user's perspective on how a lot of people are going to be evaluating these things, which is oftentimes in a vacuum. And that can lead to some issues where, okay, maybe this one sounds better to my ears, even though it's less authentic, but that is the real user experience. And I think it's important to cover that aspect of it. And because there's some great tones that I can't match with real tube amps. Section five is where everything comes together into a quote unquote rig shootout. I could go all day comparing one by one all of the individual tube screamer models and bucket brigade delay models and boss CE1 chorus models across all of these pieces of gear. Or I can do the more sane thing, the way people are actually gonna be using this gear and show you what they sound like as a bundled package. Because as academically cool I think is, it would be to hear what every individual effect sounds like in isolation and then combined, that's not what people are doing, right? You buy one of these pieces of gear, you're trying to replace an entire rig, or maybe it's just worth your while to just replace one section of a rig, maybe just the amplifier in some cases. But 
for the most part, if people are going to use these as the multi-effects units that they're intended to, you're not going to mix and match too many pedals with them. You can very easily get your entire library of sounds within one device. So there's going to be several sections where you're going to hear one effect isolated with the same amplifier we might have heard before. But in other instances, there's going to be three or four effects stacked on each other. And with some of those, maybe it's a delay on top of a reverb or vice versa. And it's hard to talk about those effects in isolation in terms of how the quality stacks up from one or the other or which part is contributing the denseness of the echo or the length of those delay trails. But this is kind of more realistic to me because that's how people are going to use it. And more importantly, that's how you hear these things in music. And in fact, this is one step above that in terms of non-reality because you're going to hear these things compressed and mixed down. And at that point, it becomes even less important to some extent. But I think we can still intelligently talk about these as a package, how successful they are at those individual rigs, those unique sounds within the context of a song. But I think that is what is important. It's less important to me that the tone knob on the Tube Screamer reacts exactly the same way that the tone knob on my real life analog Tube Screamer does. It's can I manipulate the controls in tandem with the amp models, in tandem with the cab controls, in tandem with the EQs to make it sound functionally the same? Does it still feel good to play through? Does it still achieve that vision I have? And if so, it's a successful amp modeler in my book. Those are exactly the kind of things I'll be talking about in the sixth section where I analyze some of the results of these shootouts and I won't go again into depth on every single aspect of it, every amp, you know, one by one or every pedal one by one. Just kind of my generalized thoughts and some of the highlights that I picked up on during this whole insane process of reamping and dialing in sounds and reamping again after I figured out that I had the wrong effect on and it sounded close, but it wasn't quite the same. A lot of that happened. You're more than likely going to see mistakes throughout this video that don't necessarily reflect the audio, but uh, maybe I hit record on the wrong thing or I fat fingered a switch or whatever. But in general, you're going to see the effects on screen as they should follow. And then finally, for the conclusion is where I'll kind of make my high level recommendations based off of what you're going for, the price points you're looking at, where I think the technology is with all the modelers and of course the real tube amplifiers and rigs that we're evaluating as well. And hopefully impart some insight into this conversation that has not been had before because a lot of this topic has been covered to death, but this is some of the content that I wanted to see when I was looking at these amp modelers intently. Again, if you're totally results oriented and want to skip to the shootouts, feel free to do so at the chapters that I described a moment ago. But I think it's worth taking some time to introduce each one of these units, talk about why I chose these for the shootouts and for the previous reviews I did on them, and kind of what this video means to me, because in my mind, this is very much a capstone project. This is kind of the final step to a lot of the things I've been doing the past three and even four years on this channel. Because when I started Plague Size Studios, and even a year or two prior to that, I'd been intently watching what all three of these companies were doing, and I'd pretty much set my sights on uh, buying one of these. Uh, of course, being in college or fresh out of college, I couldn't buy all of them and just send back the ones I didn't like the, the most, or you know, go out and you know find each one. I, I didn't know anybody with them, so it was kind of a difficult decision, sight unseen, to just go drop how many ever a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars on something that I knew I wanted to get into that space, but you know, who was doing it the best? And even if they sounded the best, would I like using it the best? So this is kind of a opportunity for me to hopefully pass this experience on to someone, save them some headaches, save them some lost sleep, and hopefully lost thousands of dollars if they end up being unhappy with their purchase. I'm gonna kind of show you why I think the way I do, why I've gone through the gear that I have, and hopefully by the end of this video, if you watch no other content on any of these, it will give you enough information to make the right decision for you if you're looking into one of these three modeling platforms. Before I formally introduce the gear that is here though, I think it's best that I address what would otherwise be probably the most common question in the comments, and it still might be, who knows, 
uh, where is X amp modeler? Where's that mover device I like that competes with the Pod Go at this price bracket? Where's that Zoom floorboard? Where's the Quad Cortex? That's the one I really expect to be mentioned a lot. When we're talking about Kemper and Line 6 and Fractal Audio, these guys have had years in this game to perfect their craft. This stuff's been in the oven a while, right? Uh, from the you know Line 6 original pod and even the uh, amplifiers that preceded it in the mid-90s to late 90s, you've got the original Axe Effects around 2005, 2006. Hell, even prior to the Kemper's release in the 2010s, you had the synth projects from Christoph Kemper that a lot of that technology reportedly carried over into the Kemper profiler. So, you know, they've had decades of combined experience to make these products what they are today. And so if there's any rough edges left, I'm kind of going to criticize them for it because there's really not a whole lot of excuses left other than this is all we have for a hardware or software budget and this is what you get. But when it comes to something like Neural DSP's devices, and despite my personal opinions on how that company is being ran, I still don't think it's fair to compare a piece of hardware that's only been out a few years to things that have been out for, well, 10 to almost 15 years with the Kemper, literally this product, not just this generation, and other products that are built on you know, 10, 15, 20 years worth of experience. Because, yes, should they launch in a better state than they probably did? I think so. But I'm more interested in seeing where the quad cortex is in another three to five years than I am where it is right now because it is going to change so rapidly. These things are a little more mature and you still get a ton of updates on like the fractal audio platforms and there's even quite a few newer ones on the Kemper side. But I just don't think you're going to learn a whole lot that's going to stay relevant for long. Um, when I evaluated all of these, they were pretty mature. And even though they've gotten new amp models or some new features, bug fixes, hell, even you know quicker switching times between channels or presets, the core sound is still there. And I think there's still a lot of things that are going to be remedied or augmented on newer platforms like the Quad Cortex. Yes, I think their plug-in business has gone off the rails. Yes, I think it's completely unacceptable that they marketed a device a certain way saying that this is going to work and then only now three years later does one of those plugins work with it. And I definitely think it's not acceptable to only now release a desktop editor when Kemper had that same issue for years and you see how the response to that went. Kind of crazy that they would try to uh, rip that out of their playbook. But regardless, I want to see what that can do in a few years, not while it's still in a fairly polished beta state, as I feel that product is. So with that out of the way, these are the boxy gentlemen, or toastery in one instance, that we're actually hearing today. And if you are at all familiar with the ecosystems of any of these products, you might be asking why I chose these, especially if I knew I was going to be pitting them against one another in this video because you might look at these, you might look at the price tags and you think, well, this isn't even fair. Like, what are you expecting to get out of this? But if you look through it in a different lens than price and you kind of ignore the obvious form factor, you'll see that these are pretty common to one another in terms of capability. And indeed, I could have switched out this guy with the floorboard equivalent and the tests really wouldn't change. So really about what I had access to and what is the cheapest on the market for each individual vendor. So that's common denominator number one. Despite their price disparities, these are each the most current gen but cheapest entry-level option that you can find from each respective vendor. With the Kemper, it's a little less important because the Kemper floorboard that came out a few years ago kind of trades prices with it, and you can find them in similar price ranges used, but brand new, open box, and even generally, as far as I can tell on the used market, you're gonna find the toaster, especially the unpowered one like this, at the bottom of the price tier. Somewhere between $1,000 and $1,300 is a pretty good bet. On the lowest side of the price spectrum with the Pod Go, this is basically Baby Helix. And this is kind of a simplified version of what you can find in the flagship architecture. Most of the tones are there, all but like one or two of the heaviest models are there because they had to strip back on the computational power, obviously, fit in this form factor and this price. 
but it's going to sound within a couple firmware versions the exact same way as a full-fledged Helix would. Finally, with the Fractal Audio Systems FM3, this is the device that launched about a year and a half later after the flagship AxeFX3 coming with about the same computational power as the outgoing AX8, but with increased functionality with the new firmware and Cygnus modeling. And this comes in at about a $1,000 price point, give or take on the used market, of course. So you can see kind of clear 500,000, 1,500-ish plus or minus dollar tiers here. And there's things that are oddly similar about them to be at the price points that they are, the different ones that is. But there's also things that you could tell they, you know, one company prioritized this at this price point. One company said, oh, we got to strip this back to meet this. And I think that's going to be an interesting uh, modifier, shall we say, to the overall sound quality. Because every one of these, despite all those differences, if you make this same signal chain in a Rack Helix or an Axe FX3 or the FM9 or the uh, Helix Stomp or the Floorboard Kemper, you're going to hear those same sounds. So the audio portions of this video are representative across the entire product stack from each one of these companies. But when we start talking about expanding upon that signal chain or is that value there, is it worth you know that same amount of money for that sound or triple that money for that sound elsewhere, that's where things start getting interesting to me. The second common denominator that just so happens to coincide with these being the least expensive entry points for each vendor is that these are one amp at a time devices. What I mean by that is on something like the Axe 3 or even the Helix 4 board, you can run two amplifiers in parallel, whether they be completely stereo, one on the left channel, one on the right channel, or a partial blend or a totally mono blend, one amp on top of the other. I showed that off in the FM9 video. These can't do that. And that makes things easier for me because I wasn't going to do blended amp shootouts anyway. But again, it kind of shows you what the bare minimum hardware and cost is required to do those things. Now, it doesn't make them equal because things like the FM3 can have four amplifier models in a single preset. You just can't use them at the same time. But you can still switch amp sounds within the same preset up to basically, you know, you got eight scenes. So this can do four different amps on four scenes and then those same four amp sounds on the next four scenes. With stuff like the Pod Go, you can't do that. Within one preset, you have an amp or you have an amp off, that's it. So those four snapshots you're given are a bit more limited than what you have with the scenes here. With the Kemper, each browse profile here is one amplifier, but in the perform screen, you can move between them. You'll have a little bit of latency switching to them, of course, but it's kind of a different architecture across all of them. What you can't do on any of them, though, is stack a Plexi on top of uh, a Tweed sound. You can't have a Diesel VH4 uh, with uh, you know, a Marshall JCM800. You just can't do that, which is fine because that's how I use my real amps anyway, and that's going to be the direct comparison point. But it is interesting to see what the bare minimum requirements is from each company to achieve functionally the same signal chain because for all of these shootouts, they will be the same. A few other technical highlights before we get into the audio. The boot up time for each device is not worlds apart by any stretch of the imagination. When it comes to playing through real gear, through tube amplifiers or multi-effects pedals, generally I start turning those things on before I even grab my guitar, and it's a similar situation with these. So by the time the tubes are warmed up, you know, in 30 seconds to a minute, I'm not really waiting on it because I was doing something else anyway. I feel pretty much the same way about these devices as well. I feel like the FM3 and Podgo are a little snappier than the Kemper, especially because the Kemper, you have to go to this power off section to turn the device off, whereas it's just a physical switch on these and, and, and you're done. I also feel like the Kemper has been the least consistent over the past few years, like every update to the firmware changes how long it takes to boot up, and maybe that has to do with the amount of profiles that are on board and that sort of thing. But especially trying to get it connected to the desktop editor rig manager, sometimes it's like immediately snappy. Sometimes it's just garbage and won't find it and I have to unplug USB devices and replug this back in. Sometimes it feels like I saved something in there and it looked like it saved, but then it didn't. Um, so I definitely have that gripe about the Kemper platform. But I feel like if you treat them the same and you power it on, go do your thing, come back, 
these devices are going to be ready. And it's not like something that you're like, oh my God, just waiting forever, trying to load up a, you know, a heavy doll project or something to jam. That's not what the experience is. So I would say they're pretty comparable to loading up a tube amp. If you manage your presets and your scene changes or snapshot changes, and especially manage your expectations, I also feel like the switching dropout you hear going from one preset to another or switching from a snapshot or switching from one you know, performance to another aren't really problematic with any of these devices. Recently, Fractal Audio Systems put out a beta firmware for Axe FX3 that literally eliminated all of the audible switching dropout going from preset to preset, amp to amp, it doesn't matter. There is no lag, no dropout, no nothing. It's instantaneous, and I didn't think it was going to be achievable on current hardware, quite frankly. I'd love to know what black magic they have. But at this point now, none of these devices have that functionality. It's not trickled down to the other fractal ecosystem devices, though they think it can. And with some of these, like, switches from one amp to another on the pod go, it feels like a couple hundred milliseconds. It's nothing. This is the end of the world, and if you time it correctly, you're not going to hear it in a live environment. At least for the performances and rigs I put together for this video, I hear zero perceptible dropout on the Kemper Profiler, whether it's switching between performances, or switching between individual rigs within those performances, meaning that multiple effects are being turned on and off and switching amp profiles entirely, and there's basically no dropout and no latency from what I can tell, which is extremely impressive to me given the hardware age and that Fractal Audio is just now catching up to this functionality. That would be fair on an Axe FX3. You might be turning on or off two, maybe three times the amount of effects depending on the preset. Nonetheless, this is a non-inconsequential victory that Kemper has been holding on to for potentially the better part of a decade. I can't speak for older firmware, so I can't know for sure. But in any sort of live environment or especially a just singular amp replacement kind of application for the Kemper, this thing would be a great feature for any of those who are sensitive to audio dropout. Now, this comes with the caveat that if you load up each performance with a ton of rigs, maybe four or five in each slot, I have read that people have been able to bog down the unit and potentially you have some latency when switching between each performance or each rig, but this seems to be something that may have been isolated to older firmware and could have been just a, a simple bug. And with these lower end devices, because ultimately, despite their cost, in terms of what one preset, one signal chain can do, they kind of are on the lower end of the spectrum nowadays, I think that's what you should be expecting. And it still beats the hell out of pedal dancing. Um, I do have a MIDI switcher for my real pedals and amps that I'm showing off today. But I'll be honest, I didn't even bother programming them. I just played the pedal dance whenever something came up uh, when we, I was recording all these reamps because it's, it's a pain in the ass to set up. It really is. With this, you just set them per scene, hit save, and you click the switch that corresponds to it. It's so much better to do. And even with the Kemper, same thing. So I feel like the quality of life improvement is worth that couple hundred milliseconds of dropout whenever it does happen because it's, it's just really not that distracting to me.
Now, we're going to be spending a lot of time listening to and talking about the differences in amplifier and effects quality across all these devices, whether it be digital or analog. But at the core of each of those sounds, we have to have one variable isolated in particular. That is the cabinet sound. This isn't an application where we can just get rid of that altogether because, well, physically you can't run tube amplifiers without something emulating a cabinet, especially in its electronic role, but it sounds like garbage even if you do in the physical ways that it is safe for a real amplifier. And likewise with these, if you turn the cabinet emulation off, it just, it's terrible. Because we're not supposed to be hearing that. That's not what the circuits are designed for. So to keep them all on level playing ground and kind of get that part of the equation out of the way, we're gonna use cabinet impulse responses as that's kind of the universal standard for cabinet tones. Of course, all of these modeling devices handle those just a little bit differently. With the fractal audio systems world, you can have really high quality IRs. In fact, on the larger devices, you can have some ultra, ultra quality ones that go out to several seconds, but for the tones we're going after, that doesn't matter at all. Standard or high quality length is totally sufficient um, for capturing what I need to for a video like this especially. But you basically dump them in, <laughs> import them, and it takes it and it's happy. With the PodGo, it's a similar system, except you do have access to kind of dynamic cabs in the sense that you can move a virtual microphone around um, in, in its distance and that sort of thing. But those are ultimately a collection of impulse responses. We're just not using those. We're using outboard ones to keep it consistent. The Kemper actually converts incoming impulse responses to a Kemper cab uh, file. It's basically the same thing. It's just its own little format because you can actually basically shoot your own IR with real rigs and it's just kind of its own proprietary file. But I have seen instances where if you give it a really long length IR, one that has a lot more, shall we call it reverb, uh, time-based content, it will start chopping stuff up and it only takes so many samples and ultimately you still have that 20 to 20,000 hertz frequency response, which is what is important. So it's kind of a universal standard. And as such, with the real tube amplifiers, I will be reamping the comparative shootouts through an impulse response. Now, I'll bring that up for a couple reasons. First of all, there's still a lot of people that don't truly grasp what an impulse response is, especially outside of the realm of guitar playing. And frankly, it doesn't really matter if you come away with being satisfied with the comparison between an IR and a real cabinet, good enough. Just know that, you know, pick a file that you like and if it matches the sound you're going for, then, then you're done, right? I mean, it's the same way that a lot of people will pick an amplifier. doesn't matter what it says. Are you happy with the tone? That's all that we're really going after here. But the second reason I bring it up is because there seems to be a growing regime <laughs> of people that uh, would say the impulse response is not a good substitute for a cabinet in a signal chain or a microphone and a preamp in a signal chain because the cabinet impulse response ultimately captures the linear response of that system of a moving speaker in a cabinet with a microphone or two shoved up by the dust cap or wherever you're pointing it at going into some type of preamp. And there are non-linearities in that system for sure. In fact, you're probably going to be able to hear a few in a couple of the upcoming demonstrations because you might have compression of the microphone capsule if it's really loud. You might have a little bit of distortion, some saturation if it's really light on a tube preamplifier in that signal chain. But the frequency response, the room dynamics up to a certain length will be captured in an impulse response. That's what it does. It's frequency content from you know one frequency to whatever you're shooting, 20 to 20K in this instance, and it's time. They're one and the same. They're ultimately related. It's just a fraction, one over. Now, for the tones I go after, that's totally sufficient. And I think you're going to agree. But I'm also not the kind of person that cranks cabinets up to a level that completely overloads the microphone. I'm not the kind of person that really adds a ton of distortion post cabinet, you know, a lot of pre amplifier flavor, going for mostly kind of static EQ changes at that point. So I bring all that up to ultimately say, if you don't buy in to the cab IR, you're not going to buy into anything in this video, right? Because all my tones use the cabinet impulse response. But I'd like to show you that 
outside of very specific circumstances and ones that we're not even evaluating when it comes to amp modeler versus amp or effects pedal versus effects pedal, it doesn't matter. They sound the same. If you disagree with that, you might as well stop watching the video because I, I don't know how to make your ears hear what I do and what 99% of people do. Um, I'm sorry if you disagree, but I, I can see the uh, the love of miking up a cabinet. I love it too. And I think it does give some extra mojo for certain tones. But with what I'm going to use in this video, it would not have mattered at all in terms of tonal quality. And I would have gone with the cab IR just like I'm going to on upcoming music because it's easier to work with in post-production. You can change a cabinet sound on the fly if you're not happy with something. And ultimately, with the way that I'm using this gear, it is not only functionally identical, it is audibly identical within margin of error of how you're going to slap the microphone up to a cabinet. So what I would like for you to listen to here is a collection of impulse responses that I made from the real cabinets that I have in this room. The first of each pair of recordings is essentially a traditional guitar signal chain, minus the reamp box. Of course, this is not a live guitar for any of these recordings, so it's going through that impedance conversion through my radial reamp box. But the rest of it is traditional stuff. It's a tube amplifier directly connected to a cabinet, and there's a microphone pointed at the speaker, and the signal is going through there to a transparent preamp. For the impulse response side of the recordings, though, we're going to be diverting the amplifier signal off from the power amp line level tap, which is called slave output on all these amplifiers. And that is the exact same signal that's going to the cabinet, except attenuated so you don't blow up any line level gear that you plug it into. So it sounds the same, just minus the cabinet and the speaker. So we're going to be pumping that into my audio interface and loading up Cubase to load the impulse response. So there's a couple things to note about this. First of all, when it comes to using a cabinet IR or any line level device with a tube amp, you can't just plug the tube amp output into that device, hence why we have to have the slave output. But you also have to have some sort of speaker load because it would just be very unhappy otherwise, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so you absolutely have to have 8 ohms on that 8 ohm speaker output. But if you just go a flat resistive load that can handle you know, 50 watts, it doesn't sound right as we've explored in the past with stuff like the cab clone or indeed other resistive loads. You have to have a reactive load just like a speaker is because the speaker impedance curve for different points of its frequency response is not linear. Oftentimes you'll get a big bump around somewhere like 75 to 110 hertz, and then it'll dip off again and kind of slowly climb on the higher frequencies. And that energy, that impedance actually feeds back into the power amp, and you hear that. That is one of the big components of what makes a guitar tube power amp sound the way it does. And indeed, changing that load on the amplifier actually changes the way the amplifier reacts, minus any of the output frequency response that we hear from the cabinet. So that's a big convoluted explanation for why I'm leaving the tube amps plugged into each one of these cabinets. Because for this to be a true apples to apples comparison, the load on the amp has to be the same. Yes, I could use my load box instead, but if I'd use the load box and the IR, you're hearing a different system than what is being represented by the cabinet because the cabinet is its own unique type of load plus the output frequency response when combined with the mic, of course. So for each one of these, if I have the impulse response of a one by 12 playing, this is still plugged into a one by 12, but you're not hearing the cabinet. You're just hearing the effect of that load on the amp then you're hearing the virtual cabinet and mic. Very subtle difference, but you would hear a bigger difference between a outboard load box and the same IR because that information is not captured with the IR. It is a physical electronic property. For each of those impulse responses, I basically recorded them immediately after I shot the actual mic signal chain. And the only difference is that instead of using the tube amplifier, I switched that out with my Matrix GT1000 effects in the bridged mode, so it becomes basically a mono class AB solid state power amp, and that was used as the clean power amp to drive each one of those speaker and microphone combinations. Now, you get a little bit of a different response out of a tube amplifier if you shoot IRs with it versus solid state, 
but the solid state one in theory, as long as the frequency response is flat, and this one is, I've proven it, uh, it should be more clean and more true to just what the cabinet is doing. It doesn't make one right or wrong. It just makes it to where this has the least amount of uh, color in the signal chain. So ultimately, it's going to be as cleanly as we can do it, mic and cabinet versus impulse response. All other variables exactly the same. To my ears, the only outlier in that demonstration was the first set of recordings with the 1x12 and my Neumann knockoff Kim Crystal microphone, because I'm fairly certain I damaged that microphone. Uh, it doesn't really work for vocals anymore. It has to have a certain sound pressure for it to, to really register anything at a semi-nominal signal level, uh, and I think you're hearing that uh, because normally I don't pick up on the weird, kind of distorted, kind of crispy, almost limited sound that you're hearing out of that microphone. However, in the impulse response version of that, kind of cleans all that up and it still sounds good. It still sounds right to me, but using that microphone on more distorted signals, I've never really heard it do that. So this is a really good example of, if you have some sort of distortion or compression downstream of the cabinet, an impulse response isn't going to capture that. It's going to capture whatever that static frequency response is for that set of frequencies. However, for all the other demonstrations, once you start adding some distortion pre-cabinet, you know, especially with the tube preamp, they're the same to me. Um, and if you you disagree, okay. Um, but for for my money, instead of having a room full of cabinets, 
So that's kind of why I recommend people spend, you know, 20 to $50 on some really good cab IRs that they're going to use forever and just be done with it. Because for direct recording, it's there. It has the mojo. It sounds the same. And that is why for an apples to apples comparison, we're ditching the real cabinets from here on out. We're just going to use the tube amplifiers and a load box and those impulse responses because there's too much potential for error. Otherwise, if I use my real cabinets, the microphone might start to droop because of my crappy mic stands. Or like we heard with the cam example, we might end up mistakenly attributing some stack up distortion sound to a modeler or the lack thereof to a modeler when really it's it's a microphone contributing to that and has nothing to do with the cabinet implementation or the amplifier. So that's why for all the rest of these demonstrations, it is solely cabinet impulse responses. Once again, that point about the load boxes becomes critical for this next set of shootouts where I'll be comparing each one of my tube amplifiers and a couple different channels to the models that most closely correspond to them on each modeler, or in the case of the Kemper, it's a profile of this actual amp. I actually physically profiled my amplifiers at those settings for this shootout. Now that's really critical to point out because on something like the Fractal Audio ecosystem, there is a page where you can specifically change the load in the power section of the amplifier. In fact, I'm pretty sure the looped footage I have up here will show that here in a moment. Right there, I did not plan that. <laughs> As you can see, you can add a 4x12 Brit greenback response in the power section, or you can change that to any number of type of loads on that amplifier. And that's pretty close to what my Sur Reactive load looks like. On something like the Pod Go though, and even the full-fledged Helix software, you can't change that. It, whatever's in the model is what's in the model. So that's all you got to work with. Whereas, you know, the Fractal Audio Systems devices just have a leg up and where you're able to automatically get that model closer because I can pretty much replicate frequency by frequency my Sur Reactive load. So even though there might be some differences in the amp model, you're already a step closer than one part of the competition. Likewise, in theory, <laughs> Doesn't mean this is what's happening, but in theory, that same information is presented to the Kemper profiler because when I profile these amps, I'm not doing it as a rig. I'm doing it as the direct amp, no cabinet. So it's hearing the effects of that load box. Therefore, in theory, that information should be captured here and you shouldn't have to do any more tweaking. So for this, I'm going to be using the least amount of tweaking possible, but if there's just a couple little advanced parameters that's going to get me closer, I'm going to do it. Even if it's an EQ difference, like post-EQ, uh, we are going to go after that route to get these amps, these models, sounding as close as we can to the real thing. And sometimes that's not enough. Um, and if it's just not even close, it's not even close, and that that is what it is. I kind of gave myself a roughly... 10 minute cutoff on all these sounds. If I couldn't get it any better than that, walk away. It, you know, it's, it's just not worth it. And it's kind of, I think, a realistic representation of how I use these in real life and how much time I think you should be spending on a singular amp tone to sound like that real amp. Since this is just the amplifier comparison part, the signal chain as a result is fairly simple. It is literally going to be an amp block through a cabinet block. For the FM3, it's going to be an amp block through the cabinet block for the pod go, except for this one, you get some free blocks instead, where there's always gonna be an EQ active and you get a couple expression pedal specific blocks if you want to use them, but it's not something we're gonna be taking advantage of if we don't have to. For certain amplifiers, like this gargoyle by my right, that model does not exist in the pod go. And in fact, that specific model doesn't exist in the FM3. In fact, the single rectifier doesn't exist in any of this stuff. So in those cases, if it's a different amp altogether and we had to use a kind of a, a, an approximation of it, then I'm gonna open myself up to being allowed to use a little bit more you know, sculpting of post and, and pre-EQ to get there because it's just, you know, you're kind of pissing in the wind. Otherwise you'll never get closer. But of course, like I said, with the Kemper Profiler, it's capturing that amp, it should be dead on. And as a result, unless there's something that is totally not even close, uh, no use of EQ, again, except where necessary. For the reamping signal chain, once again, going through the radial reamp box for all of these, 
you could potentially do over USB for at least a couple of these devices, but I want to keep things uh, equal with the real amplifiers. For the output of the signal chain, it kind of depended on what each device was capable of. For the Pod Go, it's basically identical to my real amps and pedal boards, where I had the output going through the balanced line outs, it's a TRS connection, to the TRS inputs on the back of my audio interface. It's you know one little digital analog conversion back from analog to digital, but there's really no noise introduced. It's flat, it sounds just fine, honestly. Um, with the Kemper and the FM3, these have SBDIF outputs, which is technically one step up because you eliminate a conversion, it's just digital to digital, and when synced, it sounds perfect. You know, it, there's, there's no opportunity to introduce more noise in that way, but it doesn't really matter. I could have done the same thing. It was honestly a factor of convenience and, and one of those things where I'm not going to dumb these devices down just to match this because that is actually how I use these. If this had SBDIF, I would. If I had a SBDIF conversion on my real tube amps or something, I would use that as well. But it doesn't really matter. They're flat, and I think it's one of those things that even if there was variance, I would be accounting for it anyway when I dial in the gear because that's how I was monitoring each one of those things. So again, not consequential, but it's something you should know. And the final thing to note for this demonstration and the ones going forward is that for each piece of gear, you will see the corresponding desktop editor up, whether it be FM3 edit or the Pod Go edit or Rig Manager, which looks like a Timu version of the torrent sites I used to use for illegal music back in the day, <laughs> those will be on display and show you the exact settings. I thought that was a cleaner way of showing this information than what's on the screen because you start getting some glare and stack up and it's a lot quicker to navigate by mouse for me than it is clicking around these things. But you'll notice going back and forth between each of these devices, the difference in capability of each one, the uh, amount of settings that are on the pod go on a given amplifier certainly don't come anywhere near to the amount of screens you have for the FM3. And to be fair, I don't need to use a third of the ones that are on the FM3 to get the sound I wanted on most of these devices. For the Kemper, you get the amp and you can tweak a few things, but I really didn't need to and didn't really feel that was going to be beneficial anyway. Of the other modelers, just like any modeler out there, there's a chance, a pretty good one at that, that it may be missing some controls from the real amplifier. Uh, some of the Mark Series controls are not on the Mark Series amps in the Pod Go. Uh, you may have a couple revision differences in the FM3, even if it is the exact same amp model. The one they model, the physical amp they measured, isn't going to be the exact same as mine. So you kind of have to ignore where the knobs are and dial it in by ear, get it close. You can start with that but some of those differences are just going to stack up and it comes down to comparing two different amps, even though one is real, one is virtual. So you have to keep those things in mind as you listen, but just like with the whole theme of this video, we are trying to achieve that sound. Not necessarily does it have to sound exactly like this amplifier. Does it still sound like a Mark IV on Rhythm 2? Does it still sound like a hot rodded 2204 circuit? Does it still sound like a little bit more high frequency focused rectifier because that doesn't exist anywhere on here either. So keep that in mind while you listen and let's see how they stack up to the real deal.
For the previous comparisons, each modeler or profiler was dialed in, if needed, independently from one another and compared directly against the source tube amplifier sound. Meaning, once I recorded, let's say, the Kemper, I didn't reference it when dialing in the FM3. That would be, in this case, a little disingenuous because it would kind of trick my brain into trying to get it closer to the Kemper than I otherwise would, naturally. Just comparing it directly to the tube amplifier, though, I'm more likely to dial it in how I would in real life, and maybe some fundamental modeling differences or things that each device skews to will come out more naturally. Because by the time I worked my way back around to the beginning of the list on the next amplifier, I totally forgot how I dialed in the other one and, and basically how it sounded anyway. So I feel like in that instance, this was a really decent approximation of a double blind test, at least as good as I can get it with one person running this, where it's just this versus one source, this versus one source, this versus one source, and hopefully the inherent differences that come out from the workflow of each device and the limitations of them will show up in that comparison. For the next demonstrations, though, I unfortunately have to toss that philosophy right out the window and reserve it for the last set of shootouts because there is no source here. That's the whole point of this upcoming section where we're going to be listening to amp models of real life amplifiers that I don't have because I don't have an infinite pool of money. And these are ones that I don't use all the time anyway. That's why I bought the amps I did. And it's why I don't have a 5150 here, but all these do. And this is where things start getting a little interesting because this was more of an iterative process of dialing these in where I'd 
you know, maybe grab a profile and then dial this one in and then dial the pod in or vice versa and then kind of listen to the the average of each of them and say, okay, there's a fundamental middle ground core tone here that I'm really going for out of all of these. What do I need to do to get to that ideal thing that's in my head? Because I don't have the real amp to compare it to. Now, it was especially frustrating for me on the Kemper side, because as a lot of you probably already know, there are three different profiles, types of profiles, that is, on the Kemper. And two of them are kind of intermingled with one another. But the most common one is the full profile, which is what most people make. And that has an amplifier and a cabinet linked together because it's literally amp through cab through microphone. You profile the whole system, ta-da. That's great, but not for a shootout where you're isolating the cabinet with an impulse response. So what I need is either merged profiles or DI profiles where it's just the amplifier head itself, which is exactly what I did here. Merge profiles are the same thing, except it has a separated cabinet that when you disable it, you end up with a DI anyway. Now, you can take a full profile, turn off the cab block, and get a amp-only sound, but it's not authentic because this has no idea where the interaction of the cab begins and the tones of the amp by itself ends, you know? So that's not really an option. Basically, I had to find the best sounding DI profiles for each one of these amps and just kind of rock it. And some of them are not exactly what I would want to sound like for that amplifier. Fortunately, with the liquid profiling update, the gain controls and the tone stack interaction is a little bit more authentic, though I'd barely touch them anyway. But with the Helix and the current Axe Gen 3 platforms, you have controls that you don't have on the Kemper. It is linked to the real controls on the real amplifiers. And so there is more potential for these things to sound exactly what I want that amp to sound like than there ever is in the Kemper. So because we're not directly comparing to a real amplifier, these results are a little more intermixed than they should be for a perfect test. But we're not talking about perfect stuff here. And I think this is a realistic use case. And it's something that needs to be showcased about these modelers, because when you all try to make them sound similar, you can make them sound, I think, more similar than you would otherwise if you were just going from, like I was before, modeler to amp, modeler to amp, profiler to amp, and not kind of listening to each other as a reference. However, I'm certain there's still going to be inherent differences between all the platforms that pop through, and that's really going to be augmented by the fact that I'm not going crazy with pre or post EQ or changing the speaker impedance on the FM3, you're going through all the advanced parameters. I'm kind of just taking each amp model as like, okay, here's line six's attempt at 5150. Here's FM3's attempted 5150. And just leaving everything by itself without having a reference, what does it sound like when I just tweak those basic controls? And this is how a lot of people are going to experience amp modelers. They're not going to go crazy with EQ. They're not going to go crazy in the advanced parameters. And we're going to grab whatever sounds good on the, you know, Kemper profiles that are available. So I think it's still a valuable examination.
Finally, we come to the big boy, the comprehensive all-in-one rig shootout. This one is interesting because it actually has the potential to sound more authentic, at least more authentic to the sound I was going for in my head, with the modeling gear than it does with the real quote-unquote gear. Because at least for the chorus and the phaser, flanger, other modulation tones and the echo stuff, like the delays and reverbs, I don't have a tape echo. I don't have a TC Electronic 2290. I don't have a Univibe. I have a couple really high quality digital pedals to emulate those sounds, but it's really no different than what these things are doing. But those pedals aren't necessarily going to have all of those models as well. So there is a little bit of uh, digital effects versus digital effects here, but I feel like that's how a lot of people are using those kind of effects anyway. And again, it's going for the overarching sound of it. It's not so much important that, oh, this Dimension model has just a slightly different LFO on this one. It's garbage. Throw it out the window. It's Does it do the Dimension thing? Does it sound lush and have a big stereo image? That's what we're going for. If it sounds like that thing, even if it is a little bit different, even if I screwed up the tap tempo on one of these, then I consider that mission accomplished. Is it something that I could unplug this piece of gear, plug this in, play the song and it still feels right, that's kind of what we're going for. On the other hand, all of the quote unquote dry effects like equalization, drive pedals, compression, all that good stuff is going to be in a physical analog form like a little half rack or a pedal, of course. And we're gonna go about this basically one amp channel at a time. We're going to reuse those same amp sounds that we heard from the first modeler versus amp shootout because I feel this is the best way of introducing the least amount of new variables at a time while still making this a dense and compact section of the video. Because I'm not gonna go through here and play the same riff with the exact same you know, looping and one effect at a time, turn this one on, then turn this one off. I'm not doing that. We're going to use this in a way that I think represents how most people are going to use it. That is, you know, you might have a dry rhythm sound. You might have kind of, uh, you know, a more overdriven uh, tube screamer with a echo at the end, whatever. There's going to be times where multiple things come on at the same time. But I think that also highlights an important point in that if there's imperfections and maybe one effect at a time you can hear that, okay, this Tube Screamer model on this platform doesn't sound as good as this one or it doesn't react the same way. By the time you cover it up with modulation or you put a, a bunch of dense reverb on the end, you can't tell. Then as a system, it has still succeeded, even though there are a couple little fallbacks individually. And I think that's important. A lot of people, including myself, get caught up on individual details that a lot of the time in a musical application, absolutely are undetectable and they don't matter at all, especially from a producer standpoint. If you have a good, clean guitar DI, that doesn't mean I still don't want the best one because there might be times where that difference is audible. But I think that's why it's important to evaluate this from a rig standpoint, not only because it would take 10,000 hours otherwise <laughs> to go one by one and isolate every one of them, but because we wanna hear what these can do as a system in ways that I think is, is realistic with the way people are using them. Reusing these same amp sounds from the first shootout also gives you guys an opportunity to hear what those things sound like completely isolated. That way you can kind of have a sense for what the difference in the amp model is versus the difference in the modulation model or the difference in the drive pedal model. Or maybe by the time you add all that stuff together, there's no audible difference at all. So you can hear, is it a subtractive? effect? Is it an additive effect in terms of making the difference larger or smaller, or does it not really matter at all and you kind of end up with a, a transparent sort of change? So for each preset or profile performance when it comes to the Kemper, basically I'm going to use one amp channel at a time, which you have no option to do otherwise on with the Podgo and the Kemper. The FM3 actually has the ability to use four amp channels within one preset. So you could, in theory, have four scenes, all of them be independent amps, and the next four scenes you could have, you know, scene six and seven be channel A, and uh, let's say five be channel C, and eight be channel D. You know, there's a lot of possibilities with this device, but when it comes to these products, it is really just 
one scene, one preset is one amplifier, which is kind of fine. It's how I'm mostly using the real amps anyway, except for the Mark IV, which has channel switching capabilities over my MIDI setup. But there is some, I guess, capability left on the table here uh, on the FM3 side, and that's just something you have to keep in mind. Now, you can just switch presets on these other guys, and that's totally fine. Uh, but it's not quite as fast as switching within one preset on an FM3. Another difference in workflow, something else you pay for. But everything else pretty much lines up one for one with just a few small caveats. So those familiar with all these platforms probably already know, but if you're not, you might have noticed that for the Kemper Profiler and the Pod Go, there's always the same signal chain. You always have X number of empty slots you can put pedals into, you always have an amp in a cabinet. For the Pod Go, you only actually have four free effects in the sense that, yes, you have a couple before the amp, a couple after the amp, but you could move them all before the amp if you wanted. You can move them all after the amp, but what you can't do is replace the amp. That's it. You either have an amp or you don't have an amp. You don't get to use you know, a drive pedal instead of an amp for a DI application. It's just, it's there. There is CPU dedicated to that. Same thing with the cabinet. Same thing with the free EQ space. Now, fortunately, I'm using some EQ and stuff in a lot of these presets that comes in handy, but that is a bit of a bottleneck for this entire shootout. I can't have more than four unique effects on top of EQ for this, which is fine. I never went over five anyway, but if you're a real <laughs> signal chain junkie and you want to have a shitload of not only a ton of delays, a ton of reverbs, but a bunch of stuff in parallel, these two devices can't do that. There is no such thing as parallel effects on these guys. There is on the FM3, and we're not taking advantage of it today because the direct comparison with real gear, which I'm using in series, not parallel, it, that's the way I need to make it to match it. But there is capability, once again, left on the table here on the FM3. The final thing to note is that there are CPU limitations across all of these devices. It's kind of harder to run out of CPU in this kind of application where we're just, you know, throwing like a mod, delay, reverb, whatever in series. FM3 can handle that gloriously. And you can even turn up the quality of the reverb up higher if you need to and still have a little bit of CPU left over with most of these simple signal chains. You get something that's really computationally intensive, you might have to turn it down to normal or what have you. Still not going to sound bad by any means. With the Pod Go, though, you have four free slots, but they're not all created equally. Because if I loaded up, let's say, the first two with a really intensive drive pedal, and then slot number three with a really intensive chorus, like a univibe or maybe like a shimmer reverb, there's a good chance that I'm only going to be able to use the most basic of effects on that fourth slot. And most of them are going to be locked out because they're, they're too intensive and it just doesn't have enough CPU left. And that happened a couple of times, not as many times as I thought it would, honestly, but on a couple of those really heavy uh, presets I made with lots of effects, some really wacky modulation stuff and some dense echo, I kind of had to make some sacrifices. Even presets that I didn't necessarily load up every block, if I used one that was intensive enough, let's say I had to choose a different compressor than I otherwise would have. I would like to use like a, a more realistic um, analog model, but I had to use the the VEDA compressor, which got the job done, but it's not perhaps as authentic sounding as the other one because it's not a component-based model. Maybe it's just like a, a, a more simple software solution of, okay, if you get signal above this threshold, then you do this. Not necessarily uh, going about it to the same extent that maybe these other two devices were. And again, you can run into that anywhere, but whereas these devices are kind of made to be fully loaded, so to speak. The Pod Go is entry level by comparison, but I think that is part of the interest for me in this shootout is what can this do? Can this hang with stuff that is two or three times more expensive as it, since it is still using the same fundamental tones as its bigger brothers? One last potentially important thing to note, I do use a couple expression pedal effects later in the shootout, including a Digitech Whammy and a Dunlop crybaby. And for that, the equivalents on all these guys are ranging from the name brand uh, to the cheapest off-brand thing I could find, but they all do the job. I got the EV-1 from Fractal Audio for the FM3. 
Obviously the Pod Go has the built-in expression pedal, which works just fine for me. And I've got some like keyboard Moog thing for the uh, the Kemper, but basically they all, they all do their job just fine. With the Crybaby though, in particular, this is something that actually kind of works out in favor, uh, in the favor of the modelers rather, but it doesn't do the same impedance interaction on a guitar as uh, it does when you're, you know, directly plugged in because I'm reamping these signals. So there's no load on the guitar, right? A lot of these classic wah and even fuzz effects or treble booster loads down your guitar because of an impedance mismatch. The, the guitar electronics effectively see that it as the same circuit and it loads it down. And where I'm reamping this signal, I've kind of unofficially buffered it and it doesn't see that circuit the same way. Um, so it's more accurate in terms of like for like, apples to apples testing, but that's not the way a lot of people use wah pedals. So keep that in mind if it sounds a little funny to you, maybe not as throaty as you might expect this model to, but I think it's pretty accurately replicated otherwise.
that officially concludes the shootout portion of this video. So I feel a golf clap and congratulations are in order if you made it this far, including to my future self who still has to edit this nightmare. Oh my God. So if you give a damn about what I think about the results of this, uh, that will be the remaining hopefully half hour or less of this video. I'm going to try to keep it brief and stick to the highlights, but uh, it's going to be a lot harder than that sounds. And I realize that's double the length of most guitar-related YouTube videos, but wow, was this a journey and a shitload of work. And it doesn't even match the amount of work it would have been if I'd done this exactly the way I wanted to with all of the gear that I would want to do it with. But here we are. Uh, always budget and time is the enemy. So what I would start this by saying is if you've enjoyed any of these platforms, or even a real tube amplifier rig with a, a decent pedal board for the past five to 10 years. If you spent under $5,000 to me, I don't think you made a bad decision because there are no real losers here as far as I'm concerned. I could absolutely record a professional album with all of these. Would I be happier with some than others? Yeah. Would I want to have the next tier up uh, in, in terms of the product stack if I had to use one of these? Yeah, for sure. But looking at it from a big picture, at least for me, because I dialed them in, this is the gear I use, I really liked all the tones I got out of my tube amplifier setups and the real effects pedals, obviously, because it's, it's my stuff. I hope I like it. <laughs> um, I think the Collider Delay and Reverb is the most gorgeous echo effect I've ever used. Sorry, Dev, your Ocean Machine <laughs> is obsolete for me based on what this thing can do, because I really need three, you know, at the same time. Uh, and I love the Boss MD500. It's all my favorite Boss modulation effects in one. So the re between that and the rest of my analog stuff, it's everything I want, every sound that I was going for, I made with no, really no compromises other than, oh, I don't have that exact delay model or um, this, you know, ring mod doesn't do exactly what I want to. But inside the realm of what each device can accomplish, those are my benchmarks and they're perfect as far as I'm concerned. They're not perfect in terms of like, oh, this is perfectly mixed or there's not like an issue in this frequency response. No, but they are perfect for what I want them to be. However, that perfection cost, oh, I don't know, in the combined total of five to $6,000. I really don't want to think about it too much because that doesn't even include all the auxiliary stuff I need to record it or cables or probably even the pedal board that's on, or the mini switcher, just off the top of my head. Uh, you know, I, I paid in the neighborhood of $1,700 to $1,800 shipped for my Chariotone Gargoyle. I know there's been price increases since then. I've bought my Mesa Boogie amps at a combined total that would make most people puke if I said so out loud because you couldn't buy a ragged out, terrible condition Mark IV for what I paid <laughs> for these two. <laughs> combined, the guitar gear world has changed a lot in the past few years, but so has the entire world. Um, throw on, you know, I don't know, a good $1,500 worth of pedals and outboard gear. You're looking at, you know, a decent car down payment worth of stuff to achieve all of those sounds. Whereas at the high end of the spectrum over here, you're looking at, you know, $1,000, $1,300 if you buy this new and even brand new out of the box, $1,550 with insurance after the fact. I mean, just from that alone, you're crazy if you don't go the amp modeling route nowadays as your first venture into trying out new effects. It is so much more cost effective and you get so much of that same quality, if not better. Like I said, I, I don't have some of the effects that are on here. And I think if you're looking into expanding your musical horizons or want to try out a new effect, you are out of your mind not to own something that does this. It doesn't even have to be these exact effects, but you know whether it be a part of the HX stomp line or uh, an older maybe FX8 from Fractal Audio or you know something even less expensive than all those things, that's the way to go. Now, as far as sound quality is concerned, are any of these platforms perfect? No, I don't think so. But what is perfect exactly? It's kind of a moving goal. And I don't think it's necessarily 100% fair to judge, you know, the Podgo's Mark IV lead to the FM3's Mark IV lead because they were modeled off of different physical amplifiers. 
And obviously they have the, the real circuit uh, from a schematic point of view and could, you know, change the tapering and things to be the real deal, uh, you know, conceptually. But I still think if you wanted to do this the right way, you know, Line 6 engineers and Fractal Audio engineers would have to make a model off of the same physical amp and this would have to profile it. And then and only then would you get a sense, a true sense for the underlying architectural differences between these and how good they are at replicating preamp distortion or replicating the interaction of the power amp and all that good stuff. But with what we have to work with today, my overall takeaways from a package point of view is that this is your best value proposition. It sounds ridiculously close to the real thing. Once you spend some time with it, you are missing some really critical amp models. As far as I'm concerned, the fact that there's no EVH 5153 or even a 6505 plus slash 5152 on here is unforgivable. I know they all sound pretty close, but not that close. Uh, but it's hard to complain about a lot of the limitations of this platform of $500. For $1,000, this is your sweet spot right here. The functionality, the sound quality, the insane number of amplifier models on board, even if many of them are just slight tweaks on a similar circuit. Uh, crazy amount of effects. It's crazy what you can do with effects, changing the frequency response or making a otherwise mono delay stereo by adding an offset. Uh, things that I can't even do with real gear if I had it. Absolutely best value pick. And that's going beyond any conversation about the Axe FX3 or like like for like comparisons at the same price. Just at that amount of money, I just think that it is so worth the $500 upcharge over this if you can fit it within your budget. The Kemper, it's good. It's It's fine. Uh, but I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm tired of working with this green little monster. Uh, I've been really frustrated, <laughs> especially in the profiling process. Uh, I don't think the, uh, the entire workflow really works for me, and I feel like it's getting progressively worse. The high gain examples, even some of the mid gain examples, work really well. If it's got like a martial architecture, it's going to sound pretty close, even though it does those things I talked about in the Kemper review, where I think it exaggerates the low end and kind of dips out some of that uh, speaker impedance interaction and, and maybe high fives the high end a little bit. And yeah, it sounds like it's, you got a cocked wall or tube screamer up front on some, on some models. But for the most part, it does a pretty good job. It's Something is broken with the clean amps. I don't know what the deal is, and this could be the outdated firmware I'm on. It could be a bug, whatever. But the fact is a lot of people have the potential of loading up a new firmware and profiling an amp and taking it on the road or go gigging, and you're stuck with that for how many ever shows you're playing or recording with, and it's a problem because getting the Mark IV clean sound on the Kemper was just brutal. I don't understand why I thought something that was clean and pristine that you could hear replicated really well on these platforms and on the real amp, obviously, basically had no bright cap and was a, a band past honky mess, but that's what it thought it was doing. Likewise, the other Mark IV sounds are in that territory of EQ match Marshall, which I don't like, and that's very indicative of the, the Kemper platform from my experience. Even not comparing it to the real amplifiers, just hearing what these two sounded like in certain amp models, whether it be the VH4 or the 5150 or the SLO, things I'm pretty sonically familiar with, you could hear, yeah, there were some differences, might be a different amp and you might have some tapering things and maybe one platform is more accurate than the other, whatever, but they still sounded like, okay, yeah, that's an SLO to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a diesel to me. And this thing, it's like no subtlety. It's either a big boomy mess or it's brittle and honky and it just loses a lot of those fine details that separates those high gain amps, and it all ends up starting to sound really samey to my ears. Keep in mind though, as I'm giving all these things a hard time, that when I'm saying it sounds really honky or it sounds way too bass heavy here and there, I'm talking about those last 5% differences, right? I'm kind of magnifying the, the differences between all of them because we were just talking about it from a grand scale, then I, basically have nothing to say. It would be, oh yeah, I mean, they all sound really close and that's not really valuable. If you're paying this much money for this kind of stuff. I feel like we need to be that critical and 
focus in on those fine details because as I said in the beginning of this video, these guys have had time. <laughs> and with the things that the communities have pointed out on each platform, I think from my point of view, it's pretty obvious who is listening and who gives a damn the most about their product because, I mean, some stuff that has taken so long from some of these platforms is just mind-boggling to me, but at least, at least they're there on some things. Um, but the fact that I couldn't control a profiling session from the desktop manager until this most recent update is ridiculous, and I'll never use it probably because I didn't update the firmware to the most recent versions in the middle of recording this. I'll keep that similar. But overall, the Kemper sound effect, <laughs> the... Uh, overall imprint that it puts on all those profiles was dead obvious to me in every single one of these shootouts. There was parts were going back and forth between the real amp. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's close. It's really close. And I, I definitely, like I said, I could use it on an album. I could play live with this and it'd be fine. But then hearing how much closer the pod go got or how much closer the FM3 got, even if it missed something, even if there was you know, a lack of high end on the FM3 on one part, or uh, there was a little too mid-range heavy and maybe not enough bass on the uh, the pick attack on the pod go. The rest of the package was there. The rest of the, uh, the character of the amplifier was there, whereas it really wasn't on the Kemper, and it just ends up sounding like a caricature a lot of the times. So as an amplifier replicator, I'm kind of over the whole profiling thing. Uh, I think Tonex does a really good job, absolutely destroys the Kemper in, in my comparisons. Um, NAM is really exciting as a free thing, be able to you know share everybody's work, and it still has work to do with you know high noise amplifiers. Didn't get into that on the gargoyle because I've done that enough. But um, I think Kemper needs to really evaluate what they're doing because it. I'm not saying you can't get good sounds, but if you're concerned with getting the authentic sound, something that represents that amplifier, you're not getting it on Kemper. I, I'm, I'm sorry. At this point, I don't know how many more times I can prove it. Uh, it's, it's close and it's fine, but I think people should care more about getting something that sounds right. Even if it's not perfect to the same amp I have, you can tell the Mark IVs in here, they, they had some love and care to them. This is just not getting that same mojo. <laughs> it's not capturing the same harmonics. It's cheating too much. And off of hardware this old, I, know I can't rag on it too much, except for the fact that they're selling it like it was still brand new. So between the FM3 and Pod Go, I was honestly, genuinely surprised how close they sounded on a lot of those vanilla amp modelers. Uh, Line 6 has come a really long way. I got to give them props because the HD era, just it just sucked for a lot of things. Uh, there was some stuff that sounded better than X3, um, but the fun part of X3 was how just everything was was a caricature. It was all, you know, a crunch machine, and it sounded fake, but it was still fun. It was a new tone, whereas HD was neither the fun of that nor the authentic authenticity of competing products. Whereas this is... I mean, man, I, I get it. I get why people get the Helix and it's like, I don't know, like, what are you uh, fractal people talking about? Like, this is really good. Because it is. It is really good for a lot of the amp models. But matching it to a source tone still kind of sucks because if the, the amp isn't there, it's not there. Too bad, so sad. Start breaking out the EQs just like you're in the Pod XT days or the Pod HD days. It, it's the same shit after that point. Whereas with the FM3, there's so many amp models where even if you're going for a solid state amp, you can get really close by using something like an ideal triode or, or you know, uh, turning up the feedback of the power amp, negative feedback that is. But just for, for stuff like matching the Cherry Tone Gargoyle, which has some Cameron Atomica DNA in it, just loaded up that model, changed a, you know, a few parameters. It's like, oh shit, there it is. There's the differences between those things. Whereas you got to take a hot rodded plexi model and, you know, play with the mid boost and the post EQ. And it sounds close, but it still, it sounds like I took that real amp and did that with pedals. It doesn't sound like I fundamentally changed the architecture of it. So yeah, you can get a bunch of different tones, but it sounds like you're faking it ultimately with some of these pod go sounds, just like with the rectifier. I was surprised how close I was able to get with that as well, but I felt like there was some fundamental character that the different models of the rectifier, since there's many of them in the fractal universe, uh, got closer to that series. 
So in my experience dialing in tones for this video and outside of this video, I think line six is painfully close to being acceptable for me in terms of having a comprehensive amp modeler package that I would have no problem you know, playing daily. They just need to add a few more things. They're missing stuff like those real controls on the Mark IV, why there's no pull fat or pull bright when it's in the circuit, just do it. Um, there needs to be some more advanced parameters that don't necessarily have to be shown to every user. I'm cool with the checkbox of you know going to a secret menu or whatever, um, but I want the ability to, to tweak the things you can on the fractal side to match real tones or just to cultivate new ones because apparently you're not even gonna give us a, you know, a different revision of the rectifier or a 5150, so fine, I'll do it myself kind of thing. Uh, but they do need more amp models. And I'm not saying you need 15 more plexis or every, you know, mod, a Jose mod this or the Dookie mod of that. I'm just saying, you know, if it's a popular amplifier, really consider it because you got the Rev. Those models are fantastic on here. But uh, the fact that some other really common ones aren't there is, is, is a head scratcher at this point. There are certainly some edge cases where I feel the fractal audio system stuff still sounds more authentic and, and replicates some of those non-niceties about tube amplifiers, the things that oftentimes get filtered out in the 80 for 20 and the, the computationally correct mathematical models of them, even though you know you can dial stuff in to make ghost notes or sound a little odd or weird. Uh, maybe the PodGo doesn't do it, and sometimes the FM3 does. Sometimes maybe it's the other way around on other edge cases as well. But overall, I still feel like, especially with my time with it and hearing both things for so long and with working through dialing in the amp modelers that Fractal Audio Systems just really cares more about amp design, cares more about giving the user the ability to change those things if they want to. And if you don't want to, stick to the basic page and you're gonna get a good sound that is representative of that amp. So like I said, I feel like there's just a, a few extra steps Line 6 can take. And honestly, they'd be right where Fractal is, or at least they were 10 years ago, but, I really don't think the tonal quality is that far off. Not anymore. I mean, it's it's in the ballpark. Are there things that I can pick up on, on especially direct comparisons here? Yeah, but especially for the models that are one for one, I could take either one of them. You know, I could record with that Mark IV clean sound all day, no problem. For the effects quality, I'm actually really happy with where Kemper is with the Kemper drive and even their more model-based traditional stuff like the Rad or the uh, Metal Zone. They stack really well, which kind of surprised me. I figured that it might start running into more problems if you put Kemper Drive on top of Kemper Drive, but I actually thought that sounded better than stacking effects on the Pod Go. That's where that started breaking down a little bit more for me in terms of drive on drive. Uh, EQ or transparent stuff through the drive still sounded really good on that platform, but I think uh, Kemper has come a long way on that side of things, which makes me that much more disappointed that the amp platform that it's going through doesn't do a better job of handling it on especially like the, those Mark IV settings. The FM3, the Fractal Universe, especially after adding some other recent additions the past couple of years, it does exactly what I want it to do for the dry effects and even a lot of the stuff that I did to modify those effects, like put a, a kind of a clean boost in front of one of them. You can do a lot of that inside the drive block, just like you can with the amp block, turning on and off, you know, pre-boost or output EQ, time that stuff to scenes, and uh, really whatever you want to modify in those, whether it be clipping diodes or you know a different input or output EQ, changing the center tone stack frequency, all that stuff is there. You're not gonna find that on PodGo, and you'll find some slim down parameters, one of them is literally called slim, actually, on the Kemper side, but uh, most of those are just variations of sounds you've already heard. You know, they're, they're just changing slightly those parameters, whereas with the FM3, you can kind of create your own stuff. Not needed here, but something to point out. Nevertheless, slight frequency response differences aside, and you know, especially accounting for what version of the rat are you modeling, or uh, how old was the SD1 that is in this uh, particular virtual box, they all did a good job of capturing the texture of all those drive pedals when they were stacked on tube amplifiers. There was never really anything I heard that was totally wrong um, that came down to the drive pedal. Again, 
some of the stuff that I heard in the, the Mark IV that I didn't like by itself. I heard it again when you put Clean EQ in front of it on the Kemper or indeed stacking a couple of uh, Grandpa Blues Lawyer pedals in front of the clean channel of the Mark IV. But overall, pretty happy with the state of the drive pedals on all of them, but the ability to switch back and forth between like up to eight at a time on the FM3, pretty great. And of course you can do even more than that on the FM9 and the Axe 3. When it comes to the wet effects, uh, this is again an interesting point because this is digital versus digital now. We're not talking about an analog unit because I didn't have an analog one to compare with all of those, but this is how I actually replicate these sounds when playing with tube amps. I once again found the Kemper to be lacking in this area and not solely in terms of sound quality. It's not that I couldn't get a decent sound, and I even showed that in the review, just going over some of the modulation delays and reverbs. There's some pretty stuff in here, especially a lot of the uh, shimmer and, and kind of glitzy sounding reverbs. But you can't be missing a Boss Dimension sound. I had to fake that one, as you might have noticed. That was a, like a quad delay with really short delay times and make kind of a, a quad chorus sound, which is not what a dimension is, but it, it kind of served the job. So you kind of have to fake a few things that aren't there. There's almost a plasticky nature to some of the really thick effects like the flanger, uh, even some of that to some extent on the pod go, but not nearly as bad. I think that really comes down to frequency response or the lack of being able to adjust some of that stuff. And you certainly see that on Kemper. I'm really sick of the delays on Kemper. Um, they sound... I don't know, they, they, out, outdated isn't even the right word. They just don't do what I want them to do. None of them are very inspiring past the point of just, okay, here's delay, now delay, now delay less, now delay, now delay. That's it. Like it, it, You have maybe, if you're lucky, some basic frequency response controls, but there's nothing that really differentiates like the legacy base mono delay or dual delay from some of the, the ping pong, like analog stuff or a stereo bucket brigade or a tape, they all sound pretty samey. Or if there is a tape model, it's like super caricaturized and way too warbly. And that's not what most of it sounds like. Um, again, Podgo find, falls down this trap a little bit as well because yeah, there are, there's a couple stereo delay effects that I like okay, but I wasn't able to get the stereo delay sound I was getting out of that collider because it just didn't exist. It was either a mono tape or a mono this, mono that. It was not dual delay or, or not stereo. And the one that was there is just plain digital. So you kind of have to play with just the regular digital one, throw some modulation on it and hope that it sounds right. And most of the time it didn't. So it sounded fine. I didn't hate the sound, but it didn't sound like my collider. And the FM3 got really close a lot of the time. And frankly, with some of the effects I was going for, like the 2290, it got closer to what I wanted in my head. The Collider specifically is one of those pedals that I really like because it has its character. It does a specific thing in all of those models that isn't just a basic spring. It isn't just a basic analog thing. Yes, it sounds like that, but it's a little more diffused than a lot of the real things would be. And I feel like the FM3, the Fractal platform, does a better job of starting you at those real-life scenarios, the things that they, they actually sound like, whereas this is a bit more character-driven, which is fine. That, that's what I want out of a pedal a lot of the times. But in terms of capturing what I was going for from the get-go, got to give it to Fractal on the delays and reverbs by kind of a country mile on that one because you have the ability to add all that diffusion after the fact. You have that ability to go in and you know do different time ratios on each one. And it may not be as glitzy or as spacey, cloudy sounding on some of them on the basic delay models, uh, but you can always add stuff after the fact if you want to. Just like with some of the amp models, I found that some of those effects, especially like the uh, spring reverb and some of those analog or tape delays were darker out of the box than any of these other units, especially the Collider, but you can go in there and just turn up the, you know, the cutoff frequency. But I feel like that's why a lot of the times I end up with a darker, more bass heavy, less high end focused sound out of an FM3 than I would even with real gear, especially with my amplifier setups as they tend to be kind of trebly anyway. But again, even though that may not be the way I would dial it in by itself, hearing a reference, I can easily match it. And there was really no problems there. When it comes to the 
Delays, echoes on the Pod Go, they're fine. Uh, and there's even some really pretty reverbs. But by the time stuff started getting bogged down, I didn't have the opportunity to use some of those better sounding reverbs, in my opinion, and the basic Line 6 Legacy ones. They sound fine. They get the job done. You know, your halls, your plates. But uh, again, they didn't have the lush character of the Collider or the kind of like, here is the perfect plate or the perfect hall sound that you get out of the Fractal world. Modulation, kind of hard to beat Boss at their own game, but damn, does Fractal Audio come close on a lot of it. Um, the Univibe, the, uh, especially the, the Dimensions, the CE1s kind of sounds, they're there. Even the Flanger, I, I got closer than I thought I would be able to just by using the manual controls. And yeah, again, it's not a match. It's not like a perfect like for like, but it's pretty close. And I feel like the Pod Go got really close on some of them. Again, some of those modulation effects started sounding a little plasticky on some of those frequency ranges, or like it wouldn't be scooping out enough in the mids, or perhaps on a different effect, it would be too mid-focused. Whatever the case, there are some effects in here on the Helix platform that still sound like a toy to me, for lack of better terms. And I think isolated, if you only had access to some of those models on the Fractal system, they'd probably sound like a toy as well, but you have so many to choose from, it's really a non-issue. You can find one that really matches probably about any pedal and tweak it to get a lot closer. Don't really hate any of the modulation stuff on the Kemper that's there. Some of it uh, is not great. The Phase 90 was perfect, just like basically all these were. Um, I hate the stuff that's missing more so than anything. There is something about the Kemper, even with the analog delays, that does sound analog and pedal like not in a cheap way like it, it sounds maybe it's just the frequency response reconstruction the stuff that it's filtering out but i do like that bit of character from it but uh, matching the real units kind of struggles on some of those things but overall i think it did a fine job for the effects that are actually present some of the standout ones for me, the wah pedal recreation was damn near perfect as far as I was concerned on both of these platforms, but I, I got it like immediately with my FM3. I just looked down the notes that I took for uh, the Zach Wild video I made years back and uh, it was like, yep, that's done. <laughs> Sounds just right. Not nearly as happy with the wah implementation on the Kemper at first, but I finally was able to adjust the cutoff frequencies and get it closer starting out. And then the pitch effects, really good on both of these platforms. I kind of thought it sounded like ass on the Pod Go. I don't know if this is a Pod Go specific thing or if it's a Helix platform thing, but holy warble, Batman. Maybe you could, uh, I don't know, make some adjustments to where it, it responds more quickly. But there was a lot of wheel ring sound that, I don't know, maybe it's the tracking or the interpolation where it's kind of more swishy and maybe smears the effect a little bit better, which is what the actual pedal does, the whammy does. Uh, didn't really get that on the pod go, and it kind of sounded cheap as a result, like I said. And I could literally keep talking all day about my experiences with these products, but I think it's about time to wrap this up and give you my final unfiltered opinions and recommendations on these devices. Like I said in the beginning, what's interesting about this is there are you know, clear-cut price divisions between each of these modelers. But what's really interesting is that even though there are some concessions for each SKU here, the sounds you hear are still of the same quality as the devices that are a tier or two or three above that one. You know, the FM3 sounds like the FM9, which sounds like the Axe FX3. You can just do more in a preset. You do more, more quickly on those devices. Same thing with the Pod Go. You have a, a more FM3 or FM9 or Axe FX3 like signal chain to play with on the Helix. You can do things in parallel. You're not limited to X amount of effects. There's actually a couple more additional effects that aren't on here. But as far as stripping it down to a signal chain that's in series and using the amount of effects that we did, it's going to sound the same on its big brother Helix LT in the full blown Helix floorboard and rack unit. And of course, there's only one Kemper and a Kemper floorboard, the power unit, but you know, whatever. So once you price normalize all this stuff, if you were, let's say, buy the $1,500 to $1,600 unit, $1,700 even, whether it be the rack of the Helix or an FM9 or this guy brand new, it's kind of obvious which one I would go for. But once you start looking at it as 
these different prices, it, it's a little bit harder. And there are definitely things about all these products that I would criticize differently at a higher price point or even a lower price point than I would at this price point that we present here. So I want to talk about these products specifically first, and then I'll branch out to the ones adjacent to it and kind of extrapolate based off of my experiences with some of the, uh, the other ones. First of all, in our current year, I cannot recommend the Kemper Profiler to anyone. I'm kind of over it. Um, I, I don't understand why the profiling craze took off the way it did, quite frankly. Uh, I could definitely see there being cases where this did a better job of capturing a specific amplifier than a particular amp model of a competing product did. We are past that point <laughs> for most people that play rock and metal, I think. Even clean stuff, apparently, I don't know why it has such a hard time with my Mark IV. I'll say that again. Um, but I, I'm, I think it's an important piece of gear, and I think they should be proud of what they accomplished 10 years ago. I don't know why, <laughs> other than sticking with the same platform for this long and, and maybe getting some higher profit returns off of it, uh, I don't know why they've not thought about a sequel, and it doesn't seem to be happening. I, I, I don't know. Like, for me... Again, I respect that they're not making people buy something new every four to five years to keep up to date, but I think it's starting to show its age in terms of what that silicon under the hood can do and what that algorithm for the profiler can do. And to me, it's like the difference between an automatic and a manual transmission vehicle. You need to know how to drive the manual. <laughs> I'm not saying you got to do it all the time, but you need to know how to tweak your amp. You need to know how to dial in those choruses and delays and not just pick from a, you know, a preset list. And I feel like that's kind of the, the automatic version of this. And that, again, that's fine, especially for your daily driver, right? Um, if you just want to sit down and play and cultivate your skill, totally. But if you want to produce your own music and you want to sound somewhat unique or, or, or explore, you know, the, the various guitar tones, you need the manual experience every now and again. And I think that even above the sound quality is why I really don't gel with the Kemper, but the sound quality with the amp profiles, it's like, I, I don't know. If you can't hear that, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> if you're happy with it, fantastic. Is this going to sound great live? Yes. I've heard a ton of bands that play Kempers live and it sounds great. Even sounds great on recording. Would I prefer to hear them with even a Line 6 Helix now? Yeah, I really would. I mean, that's, that's not an exaggeration. Um, especially because of the effects department. You would think eliminating one of these contestants entirely from my recommendation list would make this next part rather easy, but it actually doesn't. Because at the $500 price point for the Podgo and the $1,000 price point for the FM3, I think it's really about priorities. There's a lot of similarities between these two. There's a lot of things that I think at even price out of the equation, the Pod Go does a better job than the FM3. I hate there only being three foot switches. I will never <laughs> not die on that hill. The FM9 is already a more superior product because of it. Uh, having six more and putting an FC6 next to it does not fix the woes of this thing because of the, the, the power differences. The three smart switches, they're a great idea and they work amazingly with nine or 12 switches. In my opinion, not so good here unless you're only going between three sounds and a gig. I much prefer the tactile user interface of this. That's just my opinion. However, they both have their place, I think, honestly. Um, I am going to be selling this Podgo to a friend of mine, um, and I, I think he's getting a great product, honestly. For the money, especially, I have no problems recommending this to people, as long as you are aware of and totally cool with the limitations it imposes. Because if you're someone coming from nothing, though, you have no you know, point of reference, you don't have a real amplifier to compare it to, you don't have a real pedal to compare it to, you're going to be happy as hell with the pod go. However, once that price increase starts happening with the full-blown Helix products, start having a real hard time justifying why you would pay $1,000 for a Helix LT when you can pay 1000 for an FM3. And I know I just kind of contradicted myself talking about the switches, but now you're in a totally different ballgame. And it depends on how you're going to use it. If you were absolutely all about the floorboard experience, then maybe, you know, if you're happy with the sound quality and the limitations of this, that makes up for it. Cool. 
But from a studio creator's point of view, FM3 all day long at that $1,000 price point. Because of the added functionality, because of how many models there are, the constant updates. I mean, there's been like two firmware revisions out since I started recording for this video that I'm itching to try, even though I have them on FM9, obviously, um, because they just, they work so hard on updating this platform that that alone is enough for me to, to go towards the, the Fractal Audio team. But especially once you start pushing that $1,500, $2,000 range, there is no way in hell I'm paying for the same models in this device at three times the cost for just a flexible signal chain. And flexible it is, and that's great. But no way I'm paying that when we have the FM9 on the market. Not only are there things that Fractal Audio did to basically match the Helix generation and exceed it in some ways uh, on the hardware side, especially those that, the parts that you interact with, but just the sheer fact that you don't have a fraction of the amp models. And I'm not even talking about those duplicates, the thousand plexi versions. I'm talking about real deal amps that people want, you know. It, it's inexcusable to me when you're past a thousand dollars at that point. Uh, they really need to investigate adding more because it's not so much of like, oh, this thing sounds bad because you don't have this, but the value proposition is no longer there because $500 with this many amp models compared to $1,000 with this many amp models, they, they, they battle it out a little bit better. But I basically view my Fractal Audio stuff as a full rig replacement if I wanted it to be. And it doesn't have to be, but it could be. And I have basically a huge library of authentic sounding effects, and I just do not view Helix that way in its current state. There's some really good stuff, and it's totally usable. And I honestly wish it was that way. I want some more competition. I think Line 6 did amazing things in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And I'm, I'm kind of sad to see them be this discount version of what they were even then uh, because there's just so much they're leaving on the table. And especially after spending more time with this this year, they're so close on so many things that I think they could be the big box retailer of what Fractal Audio Systems has been providing for several years now. But it's it's becoming more and more clear to me that this is your Xbox, Sony experience, and this is your full-blown PC experience. You're going to pay a premium. There's things that are a headache about it. There's a learning curve, but my God, once you get past that, it is so worth it. Ultimately then, if you're looking to spend $1,000 or less on an AMP modeling platform, I really don't think you can go wrong with the Line 6 Helix platform. They've been going at this for about eight years, and it wouldn't surprise me if there's um, a, you know, a major update within the next couple of years, uh, but I think you're not going to be disappointed. The value is really there, especially the pod go level, because it's balanced, right? The number of effects you can have at the same time, the number of effects that are available, the signal chain, it all makes sense in this package. And again, even though I would still personally go for the FM3 the way I use it, I could definitely see people that, you know, they have all the amp models and the effects they need under the hood of the Helix, and it's worth for them to have the extra foot switches and the built-in expression pedal and all that good stuff. Absolutely, you can see where that would be recommendable at $1,000. Me personally, I'm still gonna go with this thing because most of the time I'm in this room and it has more functionality as a desktop unit for me. Once you start getting into the higher dollar amount, it doesn't make sense, in my opinion. It makes more sense to stick with the high value $500 to $1,000 range of line six or you go with a fractal. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Um, I don't see the quad cortex as equivalent value competition at this point. I hope they keep iterating. I hope they keep the, you know, the whole profiling, the capture stuff, keep that ironed out. Um, and there is absolutely no way that I would recommend the Kemper Profiler to anybody. If you are someone that watches this channel and likes the nitty gritty of the waveforms and the frequency responses of the pedals and stuff I cover, if you like how much I nerd out to amp designs, you're not going to be on board with this thing. Uh, again, if you've been enjoying a Kemper for the past 10 years, you didn't make a mistake. I think you've got a solid sound, but, uh, it's just, it's it's time. <laughs> it's time to do something. Uh, I can only point out those same trends uh, in, in 
I guess, what is this, video number three or four that I've been talking about it. And no, this is not just some long-winded justification of my purchase of fractal audio devices. There's nothing stopping me from selling everything I own, right? And, and being reimbursed and just sticking with a rival platform if I wanted to. But the truth is I keep coming back to Fractal because they did everything correctly to make me interested in them in the first place, to make me hear differences in other shootouts, you know, almost 10 years ago at this point in the first place. And now I'm just hearing the <laughs> that developed another decade and it's it's still there. In my opinion, they're, they're still leading the pack and I will continue to support them. And I've pretty much learned everything else I wanted to about uh, the Line 6 and Kemper products. So, like I said, this one's spoken for. These two will be on sale on uh, my Reverb shop. So when those are up, I will uh, notify you guys. should be the same day as this video drops, as the kids would say. Um, selling the FM3 because I already have the FM9. No reason to have both. And uh, hopefully get it at a pretty competitive price. I want to be completely honest with you, though. I would recommend the FM3. Anybody that, that likes it and wants some free presets made by me, go for it. I'm not recommending anybody buy my Kemper who <laughs> watches this video. I'm really not. Uh, it can sit there for a while. I would, I, I would rather not uh, be dishonest to you people to, to, to flip a sale. If you really want it, okay, fine. But uh, I, I wouldn't buy it again would, would be my whole conclusion. Holy smokes, I'm up to just shy of two hours and 45 minutes of uh, sitting in front of this camera. My throat is super dry, and I don't know what else I could possibly do to talk about this stuff, but I'm probably going to because I have an idea, um, some ideas I'd like to share in kind of a wish list video specifically pointed at one manufacturer featured in this video. If you did make it to the end, thank you so very much. Uh, this was so much work. I'm not one to just bitch and moan about, oh, how much work I put into these videos. Th this one was a lot though. And uh, I really hope it was valuable to somebody. It was valuable to me, um, and, which is I think important, but I uh, hope I communicated that stuff across effectively. And uh, probably want to take a little breather to make these next couple of videos a little more relaxed. Uh, Hopefully it won't take me three months to complete it. That way my next upcoming big project can land with some momentum. Please don't ask too many questions, but if you got any, leave them down below and we will see you next time. Bye.